All righty, we are going to get started here. This is um, everything you want to know about the COVID vaccine. Uh, my name is Dr. Valda Crowder. Also, people just call me Dr. V. I've been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years, um, and I've treated patients across um, uh, four pandemics, two category five hurricanes, and one mass shooting. Um, so all of these presentations are taped except for the Q&A. Um, they all have a date on them. You can go to my website, askdrv.us, and that has um, this recording if you want to watch it again. Um, and it also has the source documentation for um, the content and the slides. Um, you can also follow me on at askdr underscore b on Twitter. All right, let's get started. So the structure of the webinar is a slide presentation that's about 20 to 25 minutes long, followed by Q&A. And I take your questions as long as you have them. We usually end around nine o'clock. Sometimes we end a couple minutes early. Sometimes we end a couple minutes late. We just try to make sure that everybody's questions are asked because every day you're dealing with different decisions and things that you have to decide what you're gonna do or not do. And so it's important to really sort of figure out what to do, what is the best thing to do in certain situations. All right, everyone during the presentation is in listen mode. You can ask questions using the chat icon or the Q&A. You can begin typing in questions while the presentation is going on. So you don't need to actually um, wait until the presentation is, is over. So if something comes to mind, go on to the chat icon or go on to the Q&A and go ahead and type in your question. All right, let's get started. The intention of this webinar is to keep participants informed with COVID-19 science that will help you and your family stay healthy during this pandemic. The outcome is that you will leave the webinar motivated to create or improve an action plan for yourself or your family, or you may be motivated to create or improve an action plan for a broader community like a church or a homeowners association or a school or a business. All right, let's look at what's happening here globally. The United States is 4% of the world population, 4%. Um, we represent about 25% of the deaths and we represent about 25% of the cases. Um, so globally, there's been about 2.5 million deaths and we represent about 500,000 of those. Um, similarly with the total number of cases. Now, a lot of people have asked why I'm not flying. I've added some more slides to this. Things are moving in the area of flight transportation in a good direction. So this is kind of a slide on what's going on with all of the major airlines. Um, all of the major airlines are requiring masks. Some of them do not have masks available if you need them. So Frontier, Spirit, Sun Country. Also, some of the airlines are not cleaning the flights before every flight, specifically Allegiant, Spirit, and Sun Country. Now, Delta Airlines is the only airline right now that is holding the middle seat and there will not be a middle seat that is sold on Delta flights. They're doing that until April 30th. All other airlines have actually started selling the middle seat. So you can really be um, in a quite crowded plane. Um, this is actually um, one of one of the one of our participants from the webinar sent this to me. So again, if you see interesting articles, feel free to send them to me. But now we have COVID testing at many airports. Um, now you do have to pay for this COVID testing. Some states are requiring that you get COVID tested before you enter into their state. Some are just requiring that you're self quarantined. Um, these tests vary in pricing um, from about $50 for a rapid test up to like maybe $100 for a PCR test. But these airports now have COVID testing available in the airport. Again, COVID testing yet is not yet required. Now, COVID testing is required on all Canadian flights. So they require COVID testing 72 hours before um, any flight. Uh, leaving or entering into uh, Canada. Um, and um, despite that COVID testing, they've still had over 70 flights with one or more persons on the flight that are COVID positive. Now, Canada has a very robust contract tracing system. Um, if you're on a flight with someone that is COVID positive and you're sitting near them, 
Um, they contact people usually within 48 to 72 hours. We do not do that in the United States. So we do not have a robust public health system or contract tracing system for our airline system. We should, and that would make a very big difference. Now, airports could use COVID sniffing dogs, just like the NBA. Um, COVID has a smell to it, it has a scent to it. Um, dogs are able to be trained on this scent. Um, and basically what they do is when they smell COVID-19, they sit down. Um, and that tells you that that person needs to be taken out of the line and actually COVID tested. Um, this is actually really, really important and will help actually get um, airlines, uh, airport, airport transportation um, safer, as well as large venues like basketball games, concerts, et cetera. All right, so as you all know, I always tell people respect COVID-19. It is highly, highly contagious. Minimum time of exposure to catch COVID-19 is 45 seconds. If you're talking about the variants, which are more contagious, it is 15 seconds. So how many people actually get COVID out of 100 that come in contact with it? It's 60 to 80%. It can be very high. Um, if you look at the flu, the flu is 30 to 40%. So it's much, much more contagious. As we know, it's droplet and airborne. Droplets are larger bigger than five micron, they're heavier, and they fall closer to the person. Um, that's how come the original recommendation was that you had to stay three feet away from people. Airborne are actually smaller particles. They can travel in the air uh, a lot further. Um, they can actually travel past the six feet, depending upon the temperature and the humidity. They actually stay in the air longer if it's less than 52 degrees. So this is what it sort of looks like. So if you have somebody who's COVID-19 positive and they're talking or shouting or coughing or sneezing or singing or blowing on an instrument, um, the red is the droplets and the gray are the airborne particles. So as you can see, there could be a lot of things that actually become infected in this area, including um, uh, park benches, uh, door handles, um, people's you know, shoes, uh, the ground. There's a lot of things that can actually become infected um, with this. And this is why this, this graph, this, this actually shows why a, a mask is so important. So COVID testing, the gold standard for COVID testing is a PCR test. You'll know when you had it because it's very uncomfortable. The swab is like jammed up your nose. It feels like they're actually taking brain tissue out. Um, but it's actually is most accurate eight days after exposure. It can be inaccurate if it's done too soon or too late. The antigen test is what we call the rapid test. This is really important. 30% of the time, this test tells you you're COVID negative when you're really COVID positive. So if the test is positive, it's true, but if it's negative, it doesn't mean you should go um, do a whole bunch of things. Let's just talk about our masks for just a second. The fabric mask up there to the upper left-hand side, those masks can be 20 to 30% effective. Um, it's really important that they actually have, that they're three ply, three pieces of, of cotton. The surgical mask there to the right is a little bit more effective, maybe 30 to 40%. The KN95 and the N95 mask are the most protective um, of the masks that we have you know, available at a Home Depot or something to buy or a Costco to buy. These masks are 85 to 90% effective. Um, the half Spirian mask, um, that is a N100 mask. Um, I use that um, either, you, you know, the one time I did have to fly. Uh, to come home from a job and I also used it in the emergency department. Now a lot of people wonder where are these, where are they available? Costco had a hundred of them on sale just recently for $259. So that's basically about $2.50 a mask, $2.50 a mask. Um, as everybody knows, I recommend that you get seven um, and that you use, you know, you make one your Monday mask, you make one your Tuesday mask, your Wednesday mask, Thursday mask, et cetera, for each day of the week. So then you rotate around. By the time you get back to the Monday mask, if there's anything on it, it's been deactivated. Um, so you, um, you can get together with friends and order this. Um, but um, I've also seen, uh, seen these at Costco, uh, not Costco, but Lowe's and uh, Home Depot um, in smaller bunches. You can get them 10 and 20, um, but I wanted to just show 
a lot of people have asked where to get them. Now, a lot of folks say, oh, the masks are so uncomfortable. Yes, they are. And intubating and getting on a ventilator is even more uncomfortable. So I just wanted to show somebody, show everyone what happens. What do we do when we put someone on a ventilator? And we use the laryngoscope there, which is the metal thing that he, the person has in their hand. Um, we use that and go into the back of their throat, up underneath their tongue, lift that up, and then actually then pass um, the tube that actually is used to put them on a ventilator. It's a very uncomfortable procedure. Um, we usually try to um, medicate someone first, um, but when it's emergent, sometimes we have to do it and the medication hasn't quite taken effect. All right, clusters of symptoms. We have cluster one, two, and three with COVID, flu-like with no fever, flu-like with a fever, and gastrointestinal symptoms. All of these can be preceded by loss of taste, loss of smell, or loss of appetite. But cluster one, two, and three are more likely to be self-limited and the person is actually able to stay at home and resolve this at home. Cluster four, five, and six are the ones associated with fatigue, confusion, or a combination of abdominal and respiratory symptoms. These are the folks who get in trouble. Let's just keep it plain. They wind up having to get come into the emergency department. Some of them wind up getting admitted. Some of them wind up actually um, being um, admitted to the ICU and some of them actually die. COVID toes is a symptom uh, of basically a, a, a black and bluish on your toes. It's primarily in kids um, because it's associated with a lot of inflammation. Parents could think that maybe the toes are frostbitten or the shoes are too tight. Um, when parents describe this to us over the phone, we let them know this is COVID-19 until proven otherwise. All right, let's talk about patient outcomes. We have patients who catch COVID-19 and they're either symptomatic or asymptomatic and they completely recover and never develop symptoms again. Then we have patients who catch COVID-19, they recover or they have symptoms for more than three to four weeks. We call these long haulers. About 10% of the people who catch COVID-19 become long haulers. Then we have people who catch COVID, they get over it. And then when their immunity dies down, they actually catch it again. That's called a reinfection. Um, lastly, we have folks that catch COVID, go to the ICU, um, and then when upon leaving the ICU or being discharged to home, they have what we call post-ICU syndrome. So post-ICU syndrome is where you have cognitive, mental, or physical impairment. You could have renal failure. You could have limb amputations. You could have a stroke because there's a lot of clotting that occurs with COVID-19. About 50% of the young patients who have a stroke cannot return to work. You can get scarring of the lungs and decreased lung capacity um, and have problems walking, you know, a normal block or doing house cleaning. Researchers have found that there's actually more COVID virus in the brain than in the lungs. So this is why we're seeing some of the long hauler symptoms where they're having problems with memory and balance um, and gait and thinking and kind of like a brain fog. All right, so what do you do if you found out that you're a COVID-19 positive? You wanna quarantine immediately for 24 days. Everyone, whether or not you're COVID-19 positive or not, should be taking zinc and vitamin D3. You wanna get a pulse ox, which is the machine over there to the right. The first number, the top number, SPO2, is the actual most important number. That number, if you're a healthy person, should be 95 or above. You also want to have a bathroom that's only used by yourself. You want to have your cell phone, and you want to have people leave food at a closed door. Open up your windows. And if you have the opportunity before, you, everybody should try to put a HEPA filter, which is the higher grade filter, into your HVA system. It's very, very simple. Take the filter out and put an upgraded filter in. COVID treatment. We know we give oxygen. We talked about zinc, vitamin D3. I'm going to talk about a couple of other things. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is famotidine. Um, now, you may not know what famotidine is, but as soon as I show you this slide, you do. It's Pepsi AC. It's not because you have a stomach problem. It's because it blocks histamine. COVID-19 is inflammation is inflammation all over your body. 
So famotidine blocks inflammation and it lowers hospital death rates and combined death and intubation rates. Steroids similarly also decrease inflammation. Antibodies. I really wanna talk, I really wanna emphasize antibodies because while you're waiting to get a vaccine, you can become COVID positive and antibodies are your best treatment. They decrease hospitalization by 70%. So there's two types. There's Regeneron, which is the name of the company. Um, and there's also Eli Lilly. And these are antibodies that come from somebody who's recovered from COVID-19. And they're also antibodies from a mouse engineered to have a human-like immune system. Eli Lilly's were approved in November. So this is, these are available. These are um, in, given out in infusion centers. So I just wanna actually show, you wanna make sure you know where are the infusion centers that are near you. If you are symptomatic with COVID-19 and you're over 65, you automatically qualify for an infusion. If you are 12 to 64 years old, you qualify if you have diabetes, um, you qualify if you have a BMI over 35, um, or kidney disease or some sort of immunosuppression disease. What's really important is most places will not give you antibodies if you've had symptoms for more than 10 days. The institution where I currently work will not give you antibodies if you've had symptoms for more than nine days. So do not stay at home and suffer with symptoms. If you begin to get symptoms and you're in any of these categories, quickly, quickly, quickly get to an infusion center and know where an infusion center is. All right, let's talk about ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which basically means we're just giving you oxygen outside of your body. So this is basically what it looks like. This is only used for younger patients because you do have to open up someone's chest to put these tubes in and you cannulate the vein going into their heart and the artery going out of their heart. And then you connect them to a machine and you actually take the blood out, you oxygenate the blood and send it back in. And this is what an ECMO machine, ECMO machine is. And this is for people who actually um, are not able to be ventilated through the ventilator. Uh, the UK found that um, immunity basically lasts for about three to five months. After about five months, uh, the people really don't have immunity anymore to COVID-19. Um, so there are people who have caught it twice. Um, the woman on the left was 102 and caught it twice and survived. The young man on the right was 18, he caught it twice and died. So we really don't know how this operates in different types of people. All right, now all the stuff about the vaccine. Let's go over how COVID-19 replicates in the body. So the RNA is inside the fatty coating. The orange with the spike protein is the fatty coating. There are spike proteins that connect to a receptor and that unlocks and opens up the cell and that lets the molecule into the cell. You have 70 trillion cells in your body. So these cells all have receptors on them. Then once it gets in, um, your RNA actually gets you to begin copying it. And you copy it over and over and over. It is during the copying process that a virus can actually form variants because it's always trying to become more efficient and escape treatment and escape vaccines so it can live and propagate longer. So the more copying occurs, the more likely we are to get variants. So the more rampant the infection is, um, which is what we're seeing. So it makes copies and then it reformulates itself and it heads back out and it goes in and infects another cell. And it does that over and over and over and over again. And this is how the total body inflammation actually begins. So, the vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, which are the main ones, use the messenger RNA approach. Um, it's coded for the spike protein. So your body produces just the spike protein, not the rest of the molecule. So that's really, really important. It is just the spike protein because that's what's used for entry. And then your body actually develops antibodies to it. Um, and then when you see it in the real in the real world and you get and you interface with COVID-19 in the real world, you're actually ready. You actually have antibodies against the spike protein and it will not get into your cells. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses a viral vector approach. It uses a virus for the common cold. 
and it combines the genetic material with COVID-19 and it teaches your body how to generate antibodies again to the spike protein. So that that way, when you see it, you have antibodies and COVID-19 is rendered harmless. Now, this is an important slide. These are the vaccines that we actually um, know to date. So the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine have both been given emergency authorization. The 95 and the 94 and a half percent effectiveness is actually after the second dose. For Pfizer, it's one week after the second dose. For Moderna, it's two weeks after the second dose. So you are still vulnerable to COVID in between your first and second dose. Um, Novavax is 89% effective. Johnson & Johnson has three numbers there because it's 72% effective in the US. It was 66% effective in Latin America and it was 57% effective in South Africa when the South African variant was predominant. So you can kind of see with Johnson & Johnson what happens with these mutations. Um, the benefit of Johnson & Johnson is a one-dose vaccine. So it's good to use if you're dealing with homeless people or, or, um, or in a jail setting where it's a transient population, you may not catch them again for a second dose. Um, Astra's Johnson & Johnson um, is applying I think this upcoming week for emergency use authorization um, and uh, neither Novavax or Oxford AstraZeneca currently have emergency use authorization in the United States. It is only Pfizer and Moderna. A lot of people ask me what's in these vaccines. Um, so I actually tell folks, you know, you can, if you want to take a screenshot of this, you're welcome to. This is what the FDA has on their website is actually what is actually in the vaccine as ingredients. I also get asked, is there ethylene glycol in the COVID-19 vaccine? The answer is no. There is polyethylene glycol, which is commonly found in lotions, creams, and toothpaste. Polyethylene glycol is used to help the vaccine evade the immune system and stay in circulation longer. Now, as far as side effects, um, a lot of people ask me about this particular side effect. So again, this was a um, this was slides that came from the audience. Um, there were reports in the New York Times of a rare blood disorder called immune thrombocytopenia. This does happen sometimes after vaccines. Um, the CDC has a vaccine surveillance system, um, and they have found 36 cases out of 31 million vaccines administered. Um, and this is basically where you get a decrease in the number of your platelets and your platelets are used for clotting. So for some people, they didn't even recognize that they had it. For some people, they saw a rash or, or some bruising. Um, and for some people, they actually had bleeding problems. Um, they're still trying to figure out now whether or not this incidence of 36 per 31 million is lower or higher than the normal incidence of this disease in the population to determine whether or not it's related to the vaccine. Now, I also get asked a lot, how did people develop the vaccine so quickly? Well, let me just tell you, it was not developed in 11 months. SARS actually started on November 16, 2020. This is a SARS pandemic. This um, pandemic actually um, infected 8,000 people, it caused 800 deaths across 33 countries. Rapidly, a vaccine began to be developed then. So this article here was actually published in 2005, and this actually talks about a messenger RNA vaccine and an adenovirus or viral vector approach to a vaccine. So this actual research actually started in 2005, specifically to address SARS. Now, SARS and coronavirus are very similar. They're both actually um, have a spike protein. Um, they're both coronaviruses and about 80% of their DNA is the same. So they're almost like cousins. So we happen to have a pandemic with a virus that we have already developed a vaccine for that was very similar. Had this actually been a completely new vaccine, a completely uh, new virus, we would not have been able to respond in such a timely fashion and it really would have been catastrophic. 
Now, there's been all sorts of talk about a framework for equitable allocation. Most places are not using this. Most places now are, are saying they will vaccinate people that are 65 and older, but most of them do not have the vaccine supply to do that. So one thing that I'm gonna do is share some websites and how to actually get to the places that you need to get to. DC is prioritizing patients that are overweight um, because overweight is associated, being overweight is associated with poor outcomes. There are many, many mutations. There are more mutations than we actually know. Um, we don't know about many of them because we do not have a very good genomic surveillance system where we actually test and actually see the sequence, the genetic sequence. Um, these are the known variants to date. Um, the UK and the South African ones are the ones you most hear about. Um, they're most, they're both of them are more infectious than the original COVID and the South African strain also impacts children more. So far to date, we've distributed 56 million vaccines. So what does that look like? So here's what's happened by state. Um, and as you can see, the states with the darker um, have administered more vaccines per 100,000. It's been roughly about a 50-50 uh, Pfizer versus Moderna breakdown. Um, so let's talk about what do you need to actually do to actually get your vaccine. So one, you need to search your county public health department website, county or state. Um, and when you get there, then you actually put in COVID vaccine. So let me show you what some of that looks like. So let's do it right now. This is what the Maryland page looks like. And this is the actual, um, this is the uh, website, coronavirus.maryland.gov and then they have a vaccine locator page. Again, feel free to take a screenshot. I want people to actually know what is, the, um, what, is the, what, is the, what is the website and what does it look like when you get there. Um, this is California. California is myturn.ca.gov. The White House is also sending millions of vaccines to retail pharmacies. This is really, really important because you cannot distribute all of these vaccines through a public health department. You really need to have the business community and church community to really help you with that. So this is what that looks like. So Walgreens, you sign up, you register, and this is, a, this is what their vaccine landing page looks like. Um, it tells you if you're eligible, you put in your health conditions um, and um, you can begin to either schedule or get on a waiting list. This is what it looks like for CVS. CVS is not doing all of the states. The states in red and the states listed are the states that CVS is actually giving out vaccines. Now, unfortunately in Florida, we have had um, them set up, uh, the county commissioner set up vaccines in the two richest zip codes and then set up a VIP list where people could get in without a wait despite, um, uh, despite uh, their uh, criteria. So, you know, we, we always have people, you know, when you need a hero being a zero. But let's talk about the heroes. So Amazon is in conversations with the Biden administration to see if they can help with distribution um, and COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Um, also FEMA in California has set up two mass vaccination sites. One is at Cal State in Los Angeles and the other one is at um, in Oakland um, and Oakland, California. Both of these sites can do 6,000 vaccines per day. Uh, in uh, Israel, uh, they've been vaccinating very efficiently for a while now. They have more than 50% of their adult population vaccinated. And what they're seeing now is that 90% of the COVID deaths are people who did not get vaccinated. So this is a, a, a warning from um, abroad that um, is soon, um, the COVID deaths will only be people who have not gotten vaccinated. So it's really, really important to get your vaccine as soon as possible. If you get your vaccine, send us the photo. We're doing a vaccine collage. Um, I don't care if you give me a shoulder uh, selfie, it doesn't matter, send it in and we will add you to the collage. 